digital audio tape, DAT, or DAT, as it's more commonly referred to, was brought to the market by Sony in 1987 with the intention of replacing Philips' aging compact cassette system, which had been available for almost 25 years at that point. However, despite Sony and their partners releasing a whole range of DAT-enabled devices over the years, the format never took off in the home. It did have some success, though, in the recording industry. In this video, I'll try and explain why, and I'll also find out for myself whether or not it's worth picking up an old DAT machine to add into my existing hi-fi. The reasoning behind the introduction of DAT makes perfect sense, and it's very simple. In the early 1980s, the compact disc was launched in Japan, and by the mid-80s, it was already a massive success. So effectively, we've replaced the aging vinyl format with a new digital equivalent. Time to replace the old compact cassette as well. In the mid-1980s, Sony were better placed than most to be able to realise this idea because they'd been selling a range of home digital processors since introducing the PCMF1 at the CES show in 1982. These home processors, once connected up with a home video recorder, enabled the recording enthusiast to record digitally onto video cassette tape. And whilst they'd been intended for home studios, they'd also found their way into quite a few professional recording studios. Anyway, there have been a number of people that have come up with the idea of combining the cassette recorder and the processor into one device. In fact, it goes all the way back to 1981. Technics had the SVP100 on the market, which was a digital recorder which recorded onto full-size VHS tape. However, while that might be okay in a studio, it's not really a convenient and compact format for digital audio for the general public. So after considerable development, Sony started previewing their new compact digital audio audio tape format. So at the 1986 CES show, Onkyo, which was one of Sony's DAT partners, showed off their prototype DAT recorder, and it sent shockwaves throughout the recording industry, because for the first time you could make a perfect quality copy of the original compact disc with no degradation at all because you were recording the digital signal. And that idea terrified the recording industry. They were reminded of how they felt they'd dropped the ball with compact cassette. When that system was first announced in the early 1960s, it was just dismissed as some dictation system. But by the mid-1980s, due to technological advances, Dolby B and C and things, it was now capable of making really good quality recordings of compact discs, vinyl records, and the radio. And the recording industry felt that that was lost revenue. They could have sold that person a recording if they hadn't been able to make their own. And they tried to encourage people not to do it, but obviously that's not going to have much effect. So this time, rather than try and lock the stable door after the horse has bolted, they were going to just kill the horse. Just to show you how big a deal this was at the time, I've got a couple of open letters here that were published in Billboard magazine. These are written by Stanley Gortikoff, the president of the Recording Industry Association of America. And uh, for want of a better term, he's absolutely bloody fuming about DAT. I don't think they'd publish anything like this nowadays. It's uh, certainly a little bit jingoistic in places. Let's just have a look at it in a bit more detail. There's some pretty fire and brimstone biblical type language in here, so I'll try and do it justice. An assassination is in the making. The targeted victim is the world's music industry. The assailants are Japan's equipment makers. The chosen weapon is DAT, digital audio tape. You of Japan invent marvelous machines, but you damn knows who fuel them. In DAT, you have built a system for rapturous sounds, but you imperil the creators of those sounds. You get the idea. He then goes on to say, your country overtly demonstrates it has contempt for the copyright owners of foreign recordings. And the reason he's saying this is because you could rent CDs in Japan. I don't think he'd like the idea of streaming music. And with DAT waiting in the wings, ready to invade our borders, we have no choice but to be suspicious and apprehensive. Definitely looking forward to the future there. Anyway, obviously the DAT manufacturers and the Recording Industry Association of America couldn't get together and hit an impasse. So the RIAA then took it to Congress with the intention of introducing a requirement upon DAT manufacturers to install a chip in their devices, which was supposed to be listing out for a special signal, which would also be introduced into the original recordings on CDs, for example. And if it heard that signal, it would refuse to copy them. The only problem was the signal that they wanted to put on the CDs was clearly audible to people in listening tests and ruined the original recordings. 
This sounds like a lot of sh**. Hello? So that system was going nowhere, and all this time the proper launch of DAT is getting stalled. So the manufacturers finally said enough is enough, we're going to come up with our own system, and came up with SCMS. Now that was enough to get Congress off their backs and allow the product to get to market. SCMS works by allowing you to make one digital copy of a digital source. So if you've got a compact disc player, you can copy that onto a DAT tape and make a perfect copy. However, you cannot then make another digital copy of that first digital copy. It's a pretty weak system in a way. And you can, of course, still make all the analog recordings you want. However, it's enough to finally allow the DAT product to get to market in the US, albeit it's now 1990s, three years after the original intended launch of the format. So everything's ready to go. And then a number of music publishers decide to get together and file an injunction against Sony selling these recorders in the US because even though Congress were happy with the serial copy management system, music publishers aren't. They're concerned that they're losing revenue from royalties. This dispute was in turn resolved and wrapped up within the Audio Home Recordings Act of 1992, but this long drawn out process had had a very cooling effect on the launch of DAT in the US. The RIAA were clearly never going to be fans of the format, neither were the music publishers. They never released their catalogues on DAT. There was very little pre recorded music ever released on DAT because of course they never got the volumes of the players out in the market the prices of the recorders never came down it was never a success within the home market it did however find a niche within the recording industry the professional recording DAT machines were reasonably successful of course there's only a certain number of recording studios around the world so you're never going to sell a massive lot of them although I think it's slightly ironic that the very same industry that were trying to ban DAT were quite happy to use it themselves and they quite often mixed down recordings onto DAT before they sent it off to a CD mastering house. However, when the recording studios moved away from digital audio tape onto hard drive or solid state recorders, the days of DAT were numbered, and Sony produced their last DAT recorder at the end of 2005, which is when they discontinued the product. So that effectively is the story of DAT, at least the best that I can tell it anyway. So let's now move on, change gear a little bit and have a look at some DAT recorders. The model I've got here is a home recorder from 1994. It's a Sony DTC60ES. Looking back at the reviews from the period, it got a high recommendation from Stereo Review magazine, where they said it was easily the best audio recorder they'd ever tested. At that point, it cost 1,200 US dollars. Now, mine's a European model. I picked it up from eBay for 220 pounds. Now, I picked this model because I thought it looked nice and neat. I like the colour, that kind of thing. But apparently it's quite a decent model as well. It's got super bit mapping, which is something that introduced, I think, with this model, where it was supposed to get more quality than 16 bits would normally allow. And apparently it does work. So just leave that button switched on. Of course, it comes with a remote control. There's a lot of controls hidden behind this flap on the front. They're things that you don't tend to use an awful lot. It's duplicated on the remote control, but also you can add in chapters and things like that. This model had a simplified eject mechanism which was apparently quite a bit quicker to load than some of the earlier models and allowed you to see the tape running through the window on the front there it's got the standard choice of three different record modes long play i think is 36 kilohertz and of course lets you get more out of a tape 44.1 is the same as a cd allowing you to get perfect copies and 48 kilohertz is the dat standard on the back we've got analog in and out and of course we've got the dreaded digital in and out both for optical and coax Inside, you can see the chassis here is nice and cleanly laid out, typical of your sort of mid 90s high end Sony electronics. You'll notice there's a battery on the circuit board there, and that's because DAT machines tended to have a real time clock in them that would apply the time and date alongside any recording. That's the analog digital converter chip. The thing that's probably most likely to go wrong with an old DAT machine is to do with the loading mechanism and the record head. Just like a video tape recorder, a DAT machine uses helical scan i.e. a rotating record and playhead. Now, the reason they do this is to store the maximum amount of data on the shortest amount of tape. Originally, video tape recorders used a linear scan, which basically meant you had to have a big old tape and run it at a great speed just to get enough data onto the tape. You had to run a lot of tape past that record head. 
Well, they figured out that if they had a rotating head, you could get a lot more data onto the same amount of tape by writing it at an angle to the tape. And that's exactly what a helical scan head does. Using this technique means you can run the tape a lot slower and therefore you use less tape. So it makes a smaller cassette. As you can see, the size of the DAT cassette is quite small and also notice it runs very slowly. We'll just take this opportunity to have a look at the design of a DAC compared to a Philips compact cassette. Now, the cassette has a side A and a side B, whereas a DAC just runs from the beginning to the end. You'll also notice the case is quite a little bit smaller than the compact cassette, which led to hopes that there'd be smaller personal stereos coming as a result, but that didn't come to pass more on that later on. The case itself and the overall design owes quite a little bit to videotapes and especially camcorder tapes. You'll notice that you have to move these little notches to open it up. That then opens up the sprockets, pulls the tape away from the insides. And then, of course, that tape is then also pulled out of the front of the cartridge and wrapped around the head in the machine. Now, I mentioned earlier on no major labels released their catalogues on DAT, but there were some releases from smaller labels. I mean, really just a few releases, a handful. I've managed to find a couple of tapes on eBay. All the years I've been looking, I found about three or four in total. I picked these two up, hoping that they'd have decent quality recordings, but was a little bit concerned that it was Little Richard. Obviously, they wouldn't be high quality recordings back from the 50s. And it turns out these were even later. I think they were 1960s live recordings. So definitely not reference quality. If you look on the right there, you can see the other titles that were released by this same company. It's a German label, and I don't think these are official releases, or if they are, they're very poor. But they're definitely not supposed to sound like this. <laughs> That's a good demonstration of what can go wrong with digital. If things aren't quite perfect, they can go completely off the rails. Anyway, a few goes with this cleaning tape and things started to sound a lot better. Now, I'm not going to play you any more of that. Two obvious reasons. Number one, I can't, it's copyright. And number two, well, a CD recorded to DAT would sound as good as a CD. You know what a CD sounds like. And if you had a 48 kilohertz pre-recorded DAT, it would sound a little bit better than a CD, neither of which could be demonstrated on YouTube. A couple of months ago, I put out a video about a master tape which I'd picked up off eBay, which contained a number of audio recordings of British television commercials from the 1960s. Now, whilst I was searching for master tapes, I also managed to find this. I picked up this lot for about £15, and it's the original master tapes of a number of Star Trek audio books. These would have then been sent off, presumably, to duplication houses to run off the cassettes from, but these are the original production masters. So I'll play you a little snippet back on my next machine, which is a DAT field recorder, I suppose you'd call this thing. It's the kind of thing that perhaps a reporter would carry around and plug a microphone into and interview people. It doesn't have any kind of digital in or out on this device, but it's a very nice DAT recorder. There's quite a range of these type of things. If you were thinking of getting a DAT recorder, just messing about, this might be the area in which you want to look because these things are quite a lot more reliable and bulletproof than some of the home recorders and especially the Walkman type devices. Simon & Schuster Audio Works presents Star Trek The Lost Years Written and adapted for audio by J.M. Dillon This program is performed by James Dewan with Leonard Nimoy as the voice of Spock A single steel-colored cloud advances and begins to spill rain in huge drops Both signs that he would be dead before sunrise. It's funny to think about all the people over the years that have listened to those audiobooks and they've all originated from this little tiny cassette that I've got here in my hand. Now briefly onto the subject of DAT Walkman. These came later than the home DAT recorders of the 80s. These tend to be 90s devices. There are a few different models. The ones I've got here are both recorders and players. There was a playback only model that was quite a little bit smaller. These ones are trying to do everything. I think the idea is that you're going to be a reporter perhaps and you want to use these as a recorder in the field. This one takes four batteries. This is the early one of the two I'm going to show you and it's quite a little bit larger than the other one. Now when I bought this it was worth 
working, which was a bit of a rarity for a Dat Walkman. Most of them tend to be broken, but I got it out of the drawer, and this one's not working anymore either. These things are just incredibly delicate. The one on the right is a later model where they managed to squeeze down the size even more. They ran that one off two batteries as well, which is, of course, two less than the other one. Uh, a neater machine, but again, festooned with buttons all over because they wanted it to be an all-in-one recorder and playing device. Uh, so really, there's lots going on here. And I think they're just asking too much of their engineers trying to squeeze this amount of stuff into something this small. Now, you can record digitally on both of these. You need this special lead, though, which is incredibly difficult to get hold of. Uh, the lead at the other end has an optical in and out. So you can get an optical signal out of your DAT Walkman and into it. That is, if your DAT Walkman is working, which, unfortunately, in my case, this new one doesn't seem to work either. In fact, it sounds like there's a cat dying inside it when you try and operate it. I don't know what's going on, but it's definitely beyond anything I can repair. The problem is that you've got a spinning head in here, just the same as you have in the home devices, and that makes the whole thing incredibly delicate. And then you've got that loading mechanism, which is trying to pull the tape around that spinning head. And uh, you're just asking too much of something this small. The intention was that you better bring out smaller Walkmans than you could with the compact cassette because the DAT tape is smaller. But that's not accounting for all the extra mechanical stuff that has to go on inside the machine, which unfortunately seems to be incredibly fragile. Right, let's go back to Mr. Angry for a moment, because I'm going to do now the thing that he was most afraid of happening in the late 1980s, although I'm doing it with more recent technology, a DVD player and a 1990s DAT machine, but it's the same idea. I'm connecting the coax output from the DVD into the coax input of the DAT recorder, and I'm therefore able to make a perfect digital recording off a compact disc. So we're pretending this is 1986, so a CD player cost quite a considerable amount of money in 86 still, but I've got one of those. I've also got some blank DAT tapes, which again, weren't cheap. And I've also, of course, got a DAT recorder, which again was very expensive. The prices I've got from a magazine, the equivalent price in the US in 86, I think it was, was $13 for a tape and $1,300 for a recorder. So I've got all this stuff set up. So now I'm going to copy some of my CDs for my friend. So I've already put my CD in the CD player. I now need to turn the DAT machine into its 44.1 kilohertz recording mode. And then I need to start the DAT machine off recording and then finally press play on the CD player and then I've got to wait because of course this is a real-time operation it's not like ripping a CD I have to dub the CD in real time across to the DAT so perhaps 46 and a half minutes later I can come back maybe swap over the CD record that one onto tape then come back and swap it over again maybe over the course of an evening I could perhaps put three albums onto one tape and then I could give that tape to my friend who also has to have one of these expensive DAT players to play that tape back. As you can see this is not a high volume piracy operation. And I can understand why they were fearful of it in a way but it's kind of comical and a little bit sweet when you think about it because just 15 years later we've got mp3s and there's Napster around and file sharing and things people all around the world can share all the music with everyone else and this whole idea of having to actually physically pass music to somebody is something from the past for me, though, it's all a little bit of a lost opportunity. Just think if the recording industry hadn't thrown their toys out of the pram, they could have been releasing recordings at 48 kilohertz on digital audio tape in the late 1980s, which would have sounded better than compact discs. But that's all by the by now. What am I doing with DAT now here today? Well, I'm not too sure whether or not it deserves a place in my hi-fi. If it does, it will have more ventilation clearance than this, so please don't write in. I've just shoved it in here at the moment to try it out. I've noticed you can skip tracks pretty quickly on it because the tape moves so slowly when it's playing it doesn't actually put the tracks that far apart so you can jump around it pretty quick it's neat that way but obviously not as quick as a cd if you look through the retro hi-fi enthusiast forums and websites and things you'll find very little love for dat it seems to be a technology that people are in a way glad to see the back of after all you're just dealing with a file that's digital which could now a lot easier be stored on a hard drive and it wouldn't sound any different there's no kind of romanticism surrounding dat as there is with vinyl and compact cassette. 
If you are thinking of adding a recording device into a hi-fi, there are a couple of things that might make DAT quite attractive. The machines themselves are quite often cheaper than an equivalent high-end model of cassette deck from the same era. In my case, my DAT machine cost a third the price my tape machine did, but they probably cost about the same when new. It's also easier and cheaper to find blank DAT tapes than it is now to find blank metal compact cassette tapes. And if you're having trouble, you can always use the data backup DATs the DDS ones under 90 meters work just as well as the audio tapes. Now, of course, in this day and age of streaming, there are very few people will want to record anything. It just so happened a couple of weeks ago, I did. It was a two-hour programme on the radio I wanted to record while I was out, and I could have just stuck a two-hour DAT tape in and used that. Of course, I've got plenty of alternative ways to record due to the fact I've got all these old formats, but then that got me thinking that there aren't many people now could record off the radio if they wanted to. If you buy a hi-fi nowadays, it's pretty much a consumption device. You can stream to it, maybe play CD, the radio, vinyl records, but you definitely can't record anything. They don't come with a recorder device anymore. There's no cassette, mini disc, DCC, or DAT. In effect, the recording industry got what they want. Home recording was killing music, so you can't record at home anymore. But it's a classic case of winning the battle but losing the war because most people now can play any tune they can think of at the touch of a screen without having to pay anything or hardly anything. If DAT had been allowed to make it to market as intended in 1987 and in turn been supported by all the major recording studios releasing their albums in high quality 48 kilohertz audio, you've got to wonder what would have happened to Minidisc. You see, when it was clear that DAT was a consumer electronics failure in the late 1980s, Sony moved all their resources over into their next format, which was to come out in the 1990s, which was Minidisc, and that'll be the subject of a future video. One thing to say, though, Sony did learn a lot from the DAT experience. Never again would they allow themselves to be held hostage by the recording studios. Next time, when Minidisc came out, they'd make sure that they did have pre-recorded music to release on the new format and they did that by buying a US recording studio, Columbia Records, who just so happened to be one of the major opponents to the introduction of digital audio tape. Coincidence? Probably not. Anyway, that's a story for another time. And I hope you've enjoyed this look at digital audio tape, but that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. <laughs>